At Precision Analytical, we feel that our advanced hormone testing offers a distinct advantage to both the patient and the provider, and we're often asked to compare our testing to other options that are available. In this tutorial, we're going to compare the testing model that we use to hormone testing using salivary collection. When you're testing hormones in saliva, there are a couple distinct advantages. One, for the patient, the convenience is definitely a lot easier than if you're doing, say, a blood draw or a 24-hour urine collection. The other benefit is more on the clinical side of things, and that is when you want to look at a person's hormones, you want to look at their sex hormones, but you also want to look at their adrenal hormones. When you're looking at adrenal hormones, you really want to see the daily or the diurnal free cortisol pattern. You want to see that nice higher cortisol in the morning and then come down throughout the day. And the only way previously to test that was using saliva. As you compare that to what Precision Analytical has to offer. In terms of convenience, the collection is probably a little bit easier, but it's at least on par with a saliva test as patients simply have to saturate these four filter papers with urine at four times throughout the day, right when they wake up, two hours later, around dinner time, and around bedtime. They hang, as you can see here, for about 24 hours, and then they're returned to the lab in a standard envelope. So it's as convenient as you can get for a hormone test. And when we look at the clinical side, we built this test the way we did because we agree that the free cortisol pattern that you would typically get out of saliva is a really important component of assessing a person's overall hormonal health. So our testing includes that free cortisol pattern, but it also adds some really important information that's missing from saliva testing. So let's compare these two patients. So we're trying to assess whether these patients have an adrenal gland that's producing a sufficient amount of cortisol. Now in saliva, what you're going to see is the free cortisol pattern. So here you can see a morning result, an afternoon result, and a night result. Now in saliva you're going to also add a noon collection and we don't have that collection instead we trade that out for the night collection of cortisol. So we get an overnight, a morning, afternoon, and night free cortisol that for the most part parallels what you're going to find in saliva. Now whether you're looking in urine or saliva and you see these low free cortisol results, what you would typically assume is that the adrenal gland is simply not making much cortisol, which is why the results are low. As it turns out, in a case like the one on the left, you are correct. When you look at the metabolized cortisol, the results are also low. Metabolized cortisol is the best indicator of overall cortisol production. If you look at these values on free cortisol, if you get up and over 100, that's an awful lot of free cortisol to be making. But when you look at the metabolized cortisol, we're talking about the same units and you're up in the thousands. So most of the cortisol you make ends up as a cortisol metabolite and we can see it there for the person on the left do they have adrenal fatigue or adrenal insufficiency yes it looks like they do as the levels of free bioavailable cortisol are low and the level of overall production of cortisol is also low if you look at the person on the right they absolutely do not have an adrenal gland that is not making cortisol as you look at the metabolized cortisol you can see that this patient and this is a fairly common pattern where the free cortisol is low, but the metabolized cortisol is high. So this patient is actually making more cortisol than about 80 to 85 percent of the population, but the clearance rate of that cortisol is upregulated to the point and to the degree where the free cortisol is low even though they're making a lot of cortisol. So in obesity, in long-term stress, hyperthyroidism, there are a number of conditions where that clearance of cortisol is going to be upregulated to the degree that you see this type of pattern where the free cortisol is very low but the metabolized cortisol is high. And when you're trying to ask the question, does their HPA axis or cortisol production need down-regulated 
or upregulated, you're going to get a completely different answer if you don't have all the information necessary, which is, again, the free cortisol pattern and metabolized cortisol. So you're getting a much better uh, way to assess HPA axis function. So the two benefits of saliva, convenience, free cortisol, we think we can match those and make it even a little bit better on both fronts. Now we move into some benefits of saliva testing that are really more perceived benefits than actual benefits. We just said the free cortisol measurement in saliva is a legitimately better measurement than some of the others that are available. For example, a total measurement in blood is probably not as good as the free, uh, the free hormone measurement. So what is often assumed is then that the free cortisol measurement, as you would see in saliva, is also advantageous for the sex hormones. And what you'll see is that's not actually the case. So if we look in a very practical measurement here, let's compare reference ranges for salivary assays and our urine assay. Now, if you look at saliva lab number two, look at the postmenopausal range of estradiol, there it is, compared to the premenopausal range. Now, you'll notice something. First and foremost, the ranges almost entirely overlap, which means you're not distinguishing premenopausal and postmenopausal individuals, so you're not able to distinguish estrogen deficient from estrogen sufficient. You'll notice with this particular assay, it's bad enough that the postmenopausal range of hormone is actually higher than the premenopausal range. And that's a real problem because we know that's not reality, but if you don't have a sensitive enough assay, these very low levels of estrogen in saliva make it impossible to distinguish these two groups of people. Now, if you look to the left at saliva lab number one, you'll see what it will look like in a very sensitive estradiol assay. Here is the postmenopausal range and then the premenopausal range. And what do you notice? The overlap has lessened to a significant degree. So if you want to tell if a patient is estrogen deficient, I would highly recommend the assay on the left compared to the assay on the right. But when you're comparing the assay on the left with our assay, the reference ranges are calculated the same way. Yet look at the distinction that we find in our assay. Here is a postmenopausal woman or women, and that's a reference range. And here is a reference range for premenopausal women. You can see that huge gap in between. So we can tell the difference between sufficiency, maybe a low normal result, mild deficiency, and extreme deficiency, as you'd see when, see when the ovaries are no longer functioning, no longer producing estrogen. When you look for this range, between estrogen deficient and estrogen sufficient individuals, that range does not exist for saliva testing because the levels are so low that the analytical measurement is extremely difficult. So if there's a theoretical benefit in measuring free hormone, it's entirely lost because of the difficulty in making the measurement. In urine, we're talking about almost a thousand times more hormone and we're measuring it by the utmost uh, advanced technology for measuring these hormones, GC tandem mass spectrometry. So that's a huge advantage for estrogen and a modest advantage for testosterone and for progesterone. Now additionally, when you're looking at estrogens, you can also see in urine the estrogen metabolite. So not only do we have a better measurement of whether you don't have enough estrogen, but we also have information on how you're metabolizing estrogen. So you can pick up on patients like this who have, let's say, you know, a low level of estrone, but a normal level of estradiol, but then look at their metabolites. This patient is making a lot of 16-hydroxy estrogens and 4-hydroxy estrogens, which are considered the quote-unquote bad estrogen metabolites. So the 16-hydroxy estrogens are potent. The 4-hydroxy estrogens actually have some carcinogenic potential because if you don't get rid of them by way of methylation then they can actually bind to and damage DNA and have been shown to uh, have higher levels in individuals with, among other cancers, breast cancer. Now, we can get rid of those by methylating them. And so with this test, we can also see 
the methylation activity that for this person is actually relatively low. So she may have a genetic defect, um, maybe an MTHFR or a COMT genetic defect that actually inhibits the methylation of these hydroxyestrogens, uh, which is not considered a good thing, but you don't know it unless you're testing these things. The pathway that you'd like to see preferred is the making of this 2-hydroxyestrogen as compared to these other two metabolites because it has protective properties. So for this patient, it really looks bad. Lots of bad estrogen metabolites, not very much of the good estrogen metabolites, and then very poor methylation. So again, you can only assess that if you can measure all these metabolites, and that's a major advantage for urine testing. So the second perceived benefit of salivary testing is that it's often thought of as the only only reliable way to monitor topical or transdermal supplementation of hormones. Now, our position on this is that there's a profound message to be learned from saliva testing as we learn about transdermal hormones, but it is not past the test for a reliable monitoring tool for monitoring dosages. Now, that's a complex topic, so we're going to go into it in detail at the end. So stick around at the end of this, and we'll, we'll show you the data that supports our position. Uh, but suffice to say, as a position, we don't find that the elevation in saliva in a particular individual, in a particular sample of saliva, is really a reliable monitoring tool for supplementation. Now, when is saliva testing the best way to go? I think for multi-point testing throughout a menstrual cycle, this is a great application for saliva testing. So look at the bottom at progesterone, and you can see with the lighter blue color, that's the range in which progesterone is supposed to be found. And this patient's fairly normal. Progesterone's low until day 14. What happens on day 14? Ovulation. And then up go the progesterone levels, and then back down. So you can assess those to see if somebody has a relative deficiency in progesterone or if maybe their estrogen is going and, and have showing an elevation at the wrong time within the menstrual cycle. And that's really helpful, especially when you're assessing premenopausal women uh, with some fertility issues. So there's some value in that, and I think that's probably the best application for saliva testing. When you want to test at one point in time, which is usually in this part of the cycle, right there. If you test right there, we want to know what are your progesterone levels, what are your estrogen levels, androgen levels, the metabolism of all of those, and we'd love to know your adrenal hormones as well. So with precision analytical testing, you're going to have a highly convenient test. You're going to get the daily free cortisol pattern and metabolized cortisol, which is huge. Then you also have estrogens and androgens along with their metabolites. It's a lot of information. Additionally, you're going to have a more stable value because, as we all know, hormones go up and down throughout the day as they're not secreted you know, in a very... Uh, systematic way throughout the day. There's some pulses and some increases throughout the day. So you want to average those out. The peaks and the troughs, you can average them out best by using a urine collection. And then the accuracy of the methods is important as well. With urine testing, you're able to use the very most accurate and precise methods, GC-MSMS and LC-MSMS. So if you'd like information on this test, please do feel free to reach out to us and we uh, would love to work with you and send you more information. Um, if you stick around, as I said, a little bit longer, we're going to go through this very uh, difficult conversation of transdermal hormones and trying to figure out what's going on there. The reason this is such a complex topic is because on the surface, it doesn't make any sense. When you take transdermal hormones, the increase in concentration really depends on where you look. You get a small, maybe a moderate increase in serum and urine, and some, in some cases, none at all. At the same time, when you look in capillary blood, so the blood from a finger stick, you're going to get a moderate to high increase in hormone levels. And when you look at salivary levels, they go up dramatically. So it's a completely different message in each of these body fluids. So it's very confusing. So our position, as we stated before, is saliva testing teaches us that some tissue get more hormone than is reflected in urine or in serum testing when you're using topical or transdermal hormones. 
but the levels are too variable to use in terms of monitoring dosing and they really don't reflect or the data suggests that they don't reflect systemic exposure. So let's go through a couple variables that I'm going to show you are really significant in terms of trying to standardize and use saliva testing because we know what we're trying to do is if you put a patient on a dose we'd like to measure them. If you change the dose, we would like to see that change obviously reflected in the testing. But when you're trying to see that increase in hormone reflected in the test, if there are other variables that can't be standardized or controlled that change those levels dramatically, then you're really not going to be able to succeed in achieving your goal. So here's one such variable that's very dramatic. Here's an individual putting testosterone in different places on the body. And what you'll notice is around the collarbone the levels are huge. As you get down around the forearm they're smaller and what you'll notice is there's a trend in that as you move away from the saliva gland the values go down. And they don't just go down a little bit. Look at the scale on this. It's a logarithmic scale meaning it's a dramatic shift as you move the hormones away from the saliva gland which not only tells you that's going to be very difficult to standardize and use for monitoring dosages, it also reshapes the way we think about why the levels of saliva go up and how that hormone actually gets in to the saliva gland. To add to that picture, let's look at this. What happens when a woman's on progesterone long term and then she gets off of it right here. These values are all maxed out and then they come down a little bit and at 12 weeks they're still significantly above baseline and the measurement out here at 16 weeks finally we get a baseline value. So that really should tell us there's probably some hormone getting built up in the system. The best place for that to happen if it's going on the skin would be in the fat, subcutaneous fat. So oftentimes when we put hormones on, what we think is going on is that hormone is driven into the system. That hormone then is into systemic circulation and around it goes and then the free hormone dumps into the saliva gland. The data does not support that model at all when you're using transdermal hormones. So if the transport mechanism instead was some sort of diffusion, whether it's through lymphatics or subcutaneous fat, then what you would expect to see is what? When you put the hormone over here close to the saliva gland, it would diffuse very easily into the saliva gland and you'd get a dramatically higher value. As you back off, and put it further away, it has to diffuse further, you'd get a much smaller value and that's exactly what studies have shown is that the closer to the saliva gland you put it, the, the bigger the number gets in saliva. So it may well be diffusing into the saliva gland, which doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't be using topical hormones, but it means what is in the saliva gland probably better reflects the body burden and what's going on in the fat storage than it really does uh, reflect a measurement of systemic levels of hormone. Now let's take that variable that we just talked about. Where are you putting the hormone? And let's hold it constant here and let's change, in this case, the base that the hormone is in. So here's a person taking hormones and then a washout period and then a, the same amount of hormone but in a different base and a washout period and then a third. I want you to compare the green and the blue. What you'll notice is the green has a gentle increase but it's still pretty significant. I mean this is a female taking testosterone. It's bumping her up into the male testosterone range. When she does the same thing with a different base it's a much, much bigger number. Now you might argue that well maybe there's more hormone in that base or maybe it legitimately absorbs better. But here's the point, when are you most likely to measure hormones after application? You put it on in the morning, when do you test? Typically you'd start testing around 24 hours. Now look at the values at 24 hours, they're identical. But the story that's been told up until that point is wildly different. So which of these numbers would you then take and monitor the way you're doing your hormone therapy on. It's not a reliably consistent monitor in terms of how much hormone exposure you've got. Now here's a study where, and I'm going to reduce the number on here in just a second so it's a little easier to see, but let me make a point first. This is a group of women where we're holding everything constant that we can hold constant. The same hormone, the same application site, the same base, same concentration, everything. 
Okay, we're going to put it on and then we're going to test them. Now, this is progesterone. So what we'll notice is that first off, let's put the premenopausal range in here. Now remember, these are postmenopausal women, so they wouldn't even be in the premenopausal range when they start. Now this yellow line that I'm drawing on here is not the bottom of the range, it's the entire range. The entire range of premenopausal ends at about 300. Uh, most of these women at baseline should have been around 30. So what you'll notice is the lowest maximum value is well over 1,000. So well over 10 times what the baseline value is in these individuals and close to 50 times what a baseline value in a postmenopausal woman is going to be. So every single woman in this study gets a huge surge of hormone in saliva at some point in time. Now when it goes up, as you can see, varies quite a lot from person to person. But let's put this in practical terms if we're trying to monitor hormones. These people took their hormones for a whole bunch of days. They took it this day, and then this value here is 24 hours after their, their previous application. And then you scoot out here, because we're going to monitor them after that application, and now we're at 24 hours again. So in terms of what this would look like in regular practice, this would be, you know, a day that you might test them might be right here, or they might test the next day right here. Now, if those numbers aren't reasonably similar, then that's a lot of variation to have in your testing because you might get either value, right? Whether When they collect one day or another day. Now, let's look at these. So, for this person, the first value is at about 4,500 and the second value is about 10 times less. Person number two is at about 1,500 and then we're five, six, seven times less the second time around. This person here is around two or three hundred the first time and around two thousand. So five to ten times difference for each of these three people as you collect from one day to the next. Some go up, some go down. The person who stays the same out of this group of four, you can see has a pretty consistent value from one day to the next. Some days you know, lower than some people, some days higher than some people. So the, the person in the purple, for example, is much higher on one day, but much lower on the other. But yet in the middle of the day, this person has gone higher than anyone. Okay, so the amount of variability that you see in this, and again, this is this is without introducing the variability of of where you're actually placing the hormone on the body. So you can get so much variation here that it's really going to be a struggle to get good, meaningful numbers here. Now keep in mind, these people also, if they collect urine or serum at the same time points, are not going up at all. They're at post-menopausal levels in serum, post-menopausal levels in urine, even though their saliva values are going sky high, but at variable times. Now, the other body fluid that's actually going to go up in these individuals at the same time is the capillary blood that comes out of the finger. So if you say, okay, if we take, if we take blood out of your finger, it gives you roughly the same number as your serum, unless you're taking topical hormones. And when you take topical hormones, that, for whatever reason, the the hormone coming out of that blood, that capillary blood, is a whole lot higher. So you might say, okay, well those two values then better reflect systemic hormone exposure. Well, what if we correlate them to each other? They should tell roughly the same story if they're good monitoring tools of the hormones, but they don't. They go up at really sort of random times and values, not with any synchronicity. Okay, so that's a problem. If we look at a specific example, and this is a rather extreme example, but it makes a good point. You look at these two people, their blood, serum, and their urine are not moving at all. Okay, those are baseline values. They're not changing at all. When we look at their capillary blood, what we see is that on day one of collection, we get huge values, and on day two, we get fairly normal values. Those are premenopausal levels. Those are about the numbers you're looking for. Um, and you can see they go up and down with each other. The same people's saliva at the same time tell very different stories. For some reason, this person, person A, has astronomical values in saliva, and person B 
These are still very super physiological. Those are very high values. But if those reflect the amount of hormonal exposure the person's getting, you would assume, of course, that person A is getting a whole lot more hormone than person B. Unless you go over and look at capillary blood, at which point they're, they're telling the same story. So yes, there's a general increase in hormone in both of these body fluids, but they don't really go up in the way in which it's useful to actually monitor their hormones to monitor dosing. So that can all be pretty confusing. So let's step back from that data and let's look at clinical data. Let's look at the clinical data and see what it tells us. When we take testosterone, what happens? If you take too much, you have negative feedback. Luteinizing hormone will go down. As the brain gets the message that there's too much testosterone, uh, wh whether that actual message in the local environment is coming from testosterone or estradiol, what we know is that if you give men, for example, large injections weekly of testosterone, their LH will go down to zero. It'll be suppressed entirely if you give them a lot of testosterone. Now, if you put a man on 50 milligrams of transdermal testosterone gel, saliva goes up 15-fold. The message there is what? That's a massive increase in testosterone. Serum and urine go up modestly. Two different messages. Which one's correct? Well, let's see what LH agrees with. Let's see what message the brain is getting. These men are hypogonadal. Okay, so they have low testosterone. So at baseline, before we've started doing anything, the LH value is elevated. Again, if we gave them... Well, let's take the, tes the testosterone message from saliva. If we really gave them 1,500% increases in testosterone with huge injections of testosterone, the LH would most certainly go all the way to zero. If it was a modest increase, you'd expect this elevated LH to go down within the reference range, and that's exactly what happens. So this is the 50 milligram dose here. And it goes, again, from an elevated status down into the normal range, so then, the LH suppression implies a modest dose, which agrees more with serum or urine. And to add to that, when you look at muscle mass increase in these men, the muscle mass increase is only seen in the group in which the serum goes up significantly. The saliva would go up in either group. Okay, so our position with transdermal hormones is this, that serum and urine should be considered in at least some cases, and especially with creams, not as much with gels, but especially with creams, clinical underestimations of what's going on. I'll give you a quick example. If you take estradiol, 0.25 milligrams, it will work in terms of getting rid of hot flashes. We know that from the studies from pharmaceutical products. But with 0.25 milligrams of a cream, the serum values don't go up significantly at all. So the clinical effect kicks in before serum goes up. Right? So it's a clinical underestimation. Okay? With saliva values, you get super physiological values, which tells you some tissue is getting a lot of hormone. But it's a highly variable number for various reasons. And it, the data suggests it does not represent systemic hormone levels. Okay, here's a quick example of what our test looks like on a transdermal hormone. Transdermal testosterone, here's a man, his testosterone is clearly higher than his baseline. It's really up at the high end of the range. You can look at his estrogen levels. He's making a lot of estrogen out of that testosterone. Uh, and then when you look down here at testosterone, you can see the metabolites. So remember, if testosterone gets into a cell in a tissue, within that tissue, it's going to be up it's going to be uh, metabolized to DHT, and then from there further, it gets metabolized to androstane diol. So this hugely increased number of androstane diol tells me that testosterone is getting into tissue, converted to DHT, and then converted subsequently to androstane diol within that cell, and that's what it's released as androstane diol. So when I look at this, I see a man that's probably taking too much testosterone. Now his testosterone itself doesn't reflect that, and that's what we mean. Testosterone may be a clinical underestimation. Now for testosterone, the metabolites can shed some light on that. For estrogens, they don't seem to quite as much for transdermal estrogens. So for transdermal gels, it actually works quite fine because you'll get these increases in estradiol. When you take estrogen creams, you have to be really conservative with what you're doing in terms of target values with urine with with estrogen. So it is a, uh, a bit of a confusing situation. If you have a uh, 
questions on this, feel free to reach out to us. But again, in terms of helping with the dosing and monitoring the hormone that you're taking with transdermal application, the lab testing may not be as helpful as people often think that it is. Again, for saliva testing, probably the best use is monitoring the hormone throughout the menstrual cycle. Again, if you have any questions, reach out to us. And thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.